For the past three years, Stephen Berdard has been the president and CEO of the Gilyard Center. In this special edition of Quentin's Close Ups, I sit down exclusively with him one on one. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel and download my free Quentin's Close Ups app in your Apple or Google Play stores. Stephen Bedard, welcome to Quintet's Close Ups. Well, thank you very much for being here. I'm, I'm really delighted to be with you today. Oh, thank you greatly. Obviously, you are, in my mind, the president and CEO of the Gay Yard Center. And you just told me off camera, hey, I'm, I'm going up against three years here. Yes. What is the biggest difference between three years ago and right now when you think of the Gay Yard Center? Uh, that we, we've come a long way in the last three years. Uh, you know, the, when I got here in April, the uh, facility had only been open since April, uh, right. since October. That's right. And uh, we had a we had a, some some minor funding problems, uh, as many nonprofits do when they start. But uh, we we've got we've come a long way. Uh, come a long way with our educational program, which maybe we'll get a chance to talk about a little bit more. Sure. But. Uh, it's it's been good and I've had a good time the last three years so I'm I'm probably got another about another two years and I'm looking forward to that oh a retirement maybe uh, well I'm looking forward to the next two years <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll see about retirement <laughs> what can we expect from the get yard center going forth uh, well we have a lot of uh, different things going on right now I think the the kind of the most important thing to talk about the Gilliard Center is is it's really kind of multiple things at once. It's uh, uh, when you walked in today, you probably saw a lot of tables and, and uh, chairs outside. We're getting ready for a library conference, which will start tomorrow mm -hmm. uh, for all the libraries around South Carolina. So we'll have about two thousand librarians in our building. Uh, all our folks really like the library conference because librarians tend to be a little quieter than some of our other conferees. <laughs> but uh, we have, you know, that side of the business, which is the exhibition hall and the ballrooms. Uh, the other side of the business is the, uh, the performance hall. Uh, we got a good lineup of shows coming up for the, for the holidays. Uh, we have some shows. We got, and then the symphony, who is a, re a resident uh, symphony here, has their holiday show. So we're looking forward to that. In the kind of in early December, we got Rodrigo and Gabriela, the the uh, Hispanic uh, guitar uh, duo, and they're fantastic. And then we'll uh, get into the new year with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. So we really have a wide assortment of things that we, that we do here. And in the middle of all that, we uh, are on pace to set the record this year for the uh, most students that we've had in the building since we opened. We'll probably have close to 17,000 young people come in here and uh, either for a performance or some type, some type of uh, event like that. And we're very excited about that. And uh, we just finished our first uh, uh telecast out into into the classrooms we had several hundred classrooms uh, Charlton Singleton yes. who's our chairman excuse me our uh, artist in residence emeritus because yes. he's kind of busy with ranky tanky now yes. uh, and Marcus Amaker is our present artist in residence but we've, we've, we've kept that title with, with Charlton because we love Charlton he's done a great job ever since the facility opened and uh, he gave a presentation uh, on jazz studio the ages and it was fantastic it's on our website right now and you could, anybody could go on there and, and, and watch it it's about an hour long but 1600 students were in the hall and it went to several hundred classrooms throughout uh, the region so we're very proud of the investment we're making in and reaching out to the youth in the area and I think that's kind of one of the differentiators for us you talk about those students and the mark that you made on them what particular student has had an impact on you, Stephen? Uh, well, all the students that you, that you talk to really have an impact on you, but one in particular, uh, he came up to, to uh, he was, uh, I think, about a fifth grader. Came up to came up to me after one of our shows uh, was Black Violin, which we have a poster row right there, and he came up and he said, "This is the best stadium I've ever been in." So it, you know, 
exposing young people to to a beautiful performance hall and something that they some some don't have the opportunity to to come to otherwise uh, we're uh, barrier free if you know we, we we bring in all our students uh, the highest some students pay five dollars but a majority don't pay anything we pay for the buses so uh, it's really wonderful but students like that that haven't had the opportunity it's, it's really hard felt and it really get it really says something to you yes indeed let me reread the uh, get yards bio on twitter it says this the charleston get yard center is a world-class performance hall with an elegant venue space and vibrant educational opportunities can you talk to me more about those vibrant educational opportunities right now yes we've had uh just this year we you know what we do uh we have two two full-time educators, uh, both of which uh, our director of education spent over 10 years in a Title I school. Uh, she has a background in, in music. Uh, we have a secondary educator that also Title I school has a background in music and art. And so what we do is we work with the teachers every year, determine what they think, what's important to them, and we try and uh, provide uh, content to them that, that, that is going to be helpful to them in moving their students forward in some of the educational requirements they have. Uh, give you an example, we, we might have a book uh, called Little Wild, and our educators go into the classroom, they talk to the young people, uh, then uh, the teacher works with the class to get them ready to come to the to the play called the Wild, and uh, we do some testing beforehand to see you know their their uh, recollection of the material that they they've been exposed to, sure. and then we do some testing afterwards, and we've shown a pretty remarkable improvement in that. So we're kind of proud of that. We don't. You know, we're not like engaging creative minds that has a certain number of classrooms that they have all year so they can touch the students, you know, for a long period of time. We get them kind of in short bursts, but we do think we're making a difference. That is so great to hear. And obviously, you talk about experience. And on the website, it reads this, one of the holy spaces, holy cities, most notable spaces, that is, the Gilliard Center provides the Low Country with a world class performance hall, elegant venue space, and vibrant educational opportunities, inspiring our dynamic community through the power of performing arts. Yes. What is the state of performing arts right now? Well, I think uh, Charleston has a very vibrant community of performing arts. Uh, and, you know, our, the trick is to provide things that benefit the community and not really compete with our uh, fellow uh, venues, uh, the Music Hall, the North Charleston Performing Arts Center, and, and the like. And I think one of the ways we do that is through our educational program. Those, those venues put on great shows, they do great things, but they don't, they don't provide the investment in education that we do. But I do think every hall has its own uh, Characteristics and this all uh, through the uh, generosity of Miss um, Martha Rivers Ingram and her work with Mayor Riley in renovating what was the old Gilliard Auditorium. Uh, the space is has unbelievably good acoustics. Sure. So for an acoustic type concert, a symphony, uh, a concert that's really not meant to peel the paint off the off the walls, really loud music, uh, this venue provides the opportunity to really have a, a world class performance in that type of environment. Environment. Performances. Since you've been the president and CEO, what performance stays in your mind to this day? Well, they're, 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 all, they're all good, and I try and meet every uh, artist when, when they come in the building, if I can. Some of them are a little bit superstitious, and they, they, they don't want to, they want to meet anybody until after the performance, but I try and greet everybody uh, here, and, uh, you know, a couple of them that just stand out, uh, 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 
very much to me. Uh, one of them was the Dance Theater of Harlem that we had, I think, in my first year here. Wonderful group of people. We had the artistic director uh, and uh, and that the entire group, and they put on masterworks classes for our, our students, and it, uh, they performed to a sellout crowd. So you go from the Dance Theater of Harlem to Tony Bennett, who came, uh, obviously a, a, an icon. Yes. Uh, it, at the time, he's ninety-one plus years old. Uh, met him at the met him at the you know at the stage door. We talked for a good period of time in his dressing room, and he's just a hundred percent firing on all cylinders. All there, uh, gave a ninety-minute performance, sang for ninety-one minutes straight, and uh, the. The thing kind of gives me chills even thinking about it. Put the mic down on the uh, piano and he sang Fly Me to the Moon a cappella. Wow. And you could hear a pin drop in the entire uh, performance hall and it was fantastic. And then I guess I'll end with, with these young guys Black Violin, uh, two classically trained African American uh, uh, violin players, and uh, they really. Uh, they really bring it. They bring a lot of energy and a lot of a lot of uh, emotion. And they did both a performance for our students, where we had about sixteen hundred students in the audience, and they did a sellout show uh, later on that evening. But uh, they just had the students up and going. And uh, to be honest with you, all I was worried about if the, some of the students m might not break the break the chairs. They were so <laughs> excited and they were jumping around so much. But they just had a wonderful time. Time, time. You talked earlier about obviously the Gayard Center having fundraising troubles in the beginning. Tell me, what is your fundraising goal right now for the Gilliard Center? Well, I, I didn't, didn't mean to imply that it was fundraising. It was just overall uh, uh, problems. You need to manage this facility uh, kind of as a, a multi-business model. You have you have the exhibition hall or the ballrooms, as I said, which are generate pretty much guaranteed revenue sure. and uh, so you want to have some big events in there like the library conference we're going to have here later this week uh, you want to have uh, you want to have quality performances in the performance hall uh, some of which you know you're booking mm -hmm. and they're going to lose a little bit of money but they're the right things to have in the facility so our kind of our, our model is we, we get a, a certain level of support from the city uh, to help with our educational program, to help us maintain the spaces that we're responsible in this for in this building, which is a city-owned building, right. and uh, we get uh, we get a, 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 a good amount of support in uh, philanthropy, yes. and so a combination of those two things really make the difference to allow us to put the kind of investment five hundred thousand dollars plus into our educational program to really make it world class. World class, that's so exciting. You talk about that model. What do you hope the Gayard Center will do in the next five to ten years in your mind? Uh, in the next five to ten years, what, what I would hope uh, that the Gayard Center will be able to do is uh, working with the board uh, which we have a wonderful board on the, at the Gayard Center. Uh, we're in the process of developing a strategic plan. Uh, when I first got here, everything was a little bit more tactical because of the money problems and where we were. Uh, but to kind of uh, chart the future, uh, we, you know, our, our, our goal is to create uh, enriching lives through unforgettable experiences. That's what, we, that's what our purpose is. And that's what we really are trying to get ownership of all of our employees. So in everything that we do, we want to make this the very best experience that we can make for our employees, uh, and our employees and our patrons. Sure. Uh, so in the next uh, three to five years, what I would hope is we continue to pro provide uh, exceptional programming that we're good uh, uh, keepers of the hall for both the Charleston Symphony Orchestra and for Spoleto that use our facility uh, both during during the year and that we um, just continue to provide an outstanding educational uh, uh, experience for our youth. We've been in over 100 
We've been in over 170 schools, and we've had over 170 schools here in, in, in the hall. And I think we're going to broaden out over time. We'll have some of our uh, broadcasts that, or excuse me, our performances that we're able to broadcast into the classrooms. But the magic of our educational uh investment is to get the young people into the hall and experience the wonder of, of hearing live music in a, in a world-class hall and I know uh, that's one of the things that Martha Ingram told me from the very beginning uh, when some people questioned uh, you know why she was investing her money and encouraging other people to invest their money to change the Gilliard Municipal Auditorium to to the, be the beautiful um, uh, Martha and John uh, Rivers Hall that we have upstairs, named after her parents, was that she wanted what people, what what what, kid, what youth have in Vienna and other world class cities. She wanted that for her hometown, and I think that that was a very noble thing for her to do. I mean, she, I mean she's a, a full time resident of Nashville, but she's a daughter of Charleston, and I think it's a a wonderful gift that she, Mayor Riley, and the City Council have given to the future of our community. Community. You talk about that strategic plan. What is something in that plan that you want to implement right now? <laughs> uh, well, I think what, what you know, we're starting. We're kind of building the plan from from the purpose, which I just give in, enriching uh, lives from unforgettable experiences, some of our core values that we're working on. Sure. And so I think we've already been implementing some of this uh, with the work of some of our, our customer service, uh, some great customer service people that we have come in and work with us, like David McNair, who, who does a lot of work in the local area. And so what we would like to do is we want that type of purpose and those values to be ingrained. Right now, I wish everybody that worked here felt that complete sense that they owned that purpose and those values. And then, you know, we can build out from there. But, but uh, that's, that's something I think we, need. we have implemented to a certain degree and we continue to, to foster that development in our employees. That's so amazing. Well, Stephen Bedard, thank you so much for your time. And again, welcome back to Quentin School Subs. Welcome to Quentin School Subs. <laughs> thank you. I hope to have you back. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you.